Campfire Classics is a classic literature podcast. However, your hosts will occasionally use not-so-classy language and immature humor to describe very mature situations. As such, listener discretion is advised. Hi, I'm Ken Sandberg. And I'm Emily Bosco. Welcome to Campfire Classics, where we try to read those books that look really good on your shelf. So we have a little bit of silly fun in the attempt. (laughs) So dumb. That was a great little voice. I don't know where that came from, but it was oh, cute. Listen, I, listen, I got I got lots of characters, okay? I got lots of characters. Oh, <laughs> uh, and all of these funny little character voices are why we're bringing you back. Uh, so, camper, listener, um, please help me welcome back Emily Bosco behind the mic. Yay! Yay. Thank you for having me. Of course. Uh, what's up? What's going on? What's happening? You know, um, I am I am full of turkey and potatoes. Um, very happy. Yeah. My phone is full of pictures of my cute little nephew who is now a year old and has the chubbiest little cheeks. And much of Thanksgiving was just spent watching him like be fed various things by various members of my family. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so it was very he's... wholesome, very wholesome and wonderful. <laughs> So he's entered that age where he's he's essentially the newest family dog. People are feeding yep. him scraps of whatever they can under the table, whether mom and dad want you to. And <laughs> yeah, hundred pl- percent. Playing with him maybe a little too rough, and everybody needs to wash his face and wipe his feet before he comes back inside. <laughs> well, actually, now that you say that, it was kind of a like doubly wonderful Thanksgiving because my aunt, who was hosting the festivities, just got a new puppy named Millie, who they call Millie Vanilli. Which is just, I mean, it's just oh, too no. much. Absolutely too much. I mean, much. that's adorable, but it's so cute. <laughs> but oh, geez. we went on a whole Milli Vanilli rant <laughs> a couple of episodes here at Campfire Classics. If you're a regular <laughs> listener, you'll have remembered that one. Oh no. Well, I don't know much about the band at all. I just think that my uncle thought that was a cute, cute thing to do with the name Millie, so he calls her that. And I thought it was cute too. <laughs> but like Millie and my nephew are pretty much the same size. So she kept coming up to him and like licking his little face, and it was just like little baby butt and little dog butt wiggling it was just too, it was too much like I was on I was on cute overload so it was great oh <laughs> uh, well those are the good Thanksgivings those are yeah. the family meals that you want to be at yeah I was very I was very thankful for it and then uh the Boscos also do a big um like weirdly loud and competitive uh game of either trivial pursuit or family feud after most holidays so we did family feud and there was a lot of like is it on the board steve is it on the board (laughs) so we were having a good time yeah it was wild (laughs) oh that that sounds like something that would really trigger my anxiety (laughs) (laughs) yeah i'm not very good at it at all but the joy is in the attempt right like Sure. Yeah. In saying the most ridiculous thing and being like, no, that is not on the board. OK. <laughs> I uh, I got to spend Thanksgiving with my new niece, Tristan is old. Uh, oh. She's about four months old. Oh. Um, and uh, so she's at that age where everything is about her. And that's both her idea and everyone else around the table's idea. Everyone just wanted to be. Oh, yeah. Um, touching and hugging and looking at the baby. Yep. Yeah. Oh, it's a good holiday when there's collective cooing just over whatever the cute thing is. <laughs> and then Black Friday hit. Uh, did you do any Black Friday binge shopping? You know, I I I did not. I sort of uh, I don't know. Some years I'm like I'm so morally opposed. I hate Black Friday, like capitalism. Rah. But then some years I'm like, there's some good sales here. So I don't know. <laughs> this year just <laughs> this year just kind of passed me by. Um, I went upstate uh, to uh, my friend's cabin in upstate New York with him for a couple days right after. So I was mostly traveling that day and grateful that I wasn't at any kind of shopping establishment. (laughs) That's fair. Well, uh, here at Campfire Classics, we have it's not a Black Friday release, but um, maybe if I get my ass in gear, it'll be a Cyber Monday release. Uh, We have a 2022 monthly calendar coming Ah. out for you, dear campers. Uh, It'll be up for free download on Patreon for our patrons uh, and then on both the 5050 Arts Production website and the Campfire Classics website there will be a digital version of this calendar available for download at basically 
a pay whatever you want rate. And uh, then we'll also be trying to figure out a way to print some hard copies that people can purchase if they want us to mail them a physical <laughs> copy. Uh, if you're a longtime uh, follower of the podcast, if you're a longtime listener, uh, you'll know what this calendar is all about. It's a bunch of pictures of me in strange <laughs> animal ears doing weird things. And I don't honestly remember when or why we promised to make this calendar, but it's happened. So it will be available and you can download it and print it and give it to your friends and loved ones for Christmas. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, Kenneth. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think you just wanted an excuse to create some Playgirl content. And you said, oh, let me let me let me suggest this as a as some merch for the podcast. I'm reasonably certain it wasn't me who suggested <laughs> this. <laughs> if you say so. <laughs> uh, but uh, speaking of uh, not my fault, my usual co-host Heather is actually, I believe as we are recording this, she is on stage performing in Footloose <gasps> right now, which is part of why she is unavailable to record this week. Also, because they're in the middle of the ocean all week and have crappy Internet. Mm -hmm. And so she just hasn't been able to um, have a, a, a lengthy call. But um uh campers um wish her good luck yay She's... kick off your sunday shoes but i think that's enough chit chat maybe we should get to what it is that we actually do on this podcast let's get down to business to defeat the huns to defeat the huns yep <laughs> <laughs> um so if this is your first time tuning in and if we're doing our job right every episode is somebody's first episode what we do here at campfire classics is read short stories that are in the public domain we choose stories that are in public domain because we don't want to get sued by the authors or the lawyers that control their estate uh, and we read them sight unseen, which means you're going to get a lot of strange improvised accents, some messed up dialogue, and occasionally we're even going to have to look up words that we don't understand because no one has talked that way in a hundred years. <laughs> uh, this week I have chosen a story for Emily to read out loud to you, but first I'm just going to give a little bit of fun facts because I like to put a little context around the stories that we read. Here at Campfire Classics, the coming of the holiday season means only one thing, a shift in the tone of our stories. It's time to leave the mysteries and frivolities of the rest of the year behind and turn our minds back to that genre which is truly synonymous with Christmas. Ghost stories. <gasps> Regular listeners will remember that last year we did a whole segment on how and why ghost stories became such a popular pastime, especially in the UK during the holiday season. Um, there's a line in the song, it's the most wonderful time of the year that talks about it, right? Uh, there'll be parties for hosting, marshmallows uh -huh. for toasting and caroling out in the snow. There'll be, there'll scary, be scary ghost, ghost stories, stories and yeah. tales of the glories of Christmas is long, long ago. And it's weird to me that that line never registered to me as mm -hmm. weird. Um, at least not before that I knew ghost stories were a yeah. thing around Christmas. Does does this predate Dickens? Because I wonder if Christmas Carol was the like started that trend of like it's Christmas time, no. but it's ooky spooky. It it did not. Um, it's uh, part of why Christmas Carol was such a huge success, even though as a Christmas story, even though it's basically a story about a bunch of pissed off ghosts yeah. <laughs> threatening a rich bastard into being <laughs> nice to people. Um, it, it, it became a huge holiday mainstay. And um, part of that is because ghost stories have been part of the tradition in the UK around Christmas for centuries for thousands of years like gathering around fireplaces and before fireplaces bonfires and swapping spooky stories during the darkest and coldest part of the year has been a tradition since before christmas was a tradition because many of the pagan cultures believed that as the nights grew darker and longer that uh veil between the land of the living and the land of the dead got thinner and thinner mm -hmm. meaning that the winter solstice the longest darkest night of the year is the time when the veil was the thinnest and so stories about what might be out there um naturally came to people's minds 
And, yeah. and then when other religions like Christianity decided to start plopping their holidays on top of the already established pagan holidays, <laughs> they just decided to let some of the traditions like telling ghost stories stick around. How interesting. Yep. Huh. So today's author, M.R. James, has a reputation for being one of the greatest tellers of ghost stories in English literature. We have read a couple of his stories already in previous episodes, so I'm not going to go into huge detail about him here, but this guy has the credentials. Uh, he's a writer that many writers, including H.P. Lovecraft, have cited as being hugely influential in their own work. And for more information on him, you can check out episode six of this podcast titled Oblige Them Be Blowed, where Heather gives us introductions <laughs> to the man. Today... Emily, you will be reading a story titled The Diary of Mr. Pointer. Mm -hmm. Let's get this fire started. The Diary of Mr. Pointer by M.R. James. Do you think Mr. Pointer was the Pointer Sisters' dad? I knew... How did I know you were going to say something about the Pointer Sisters just now? I knew you were, too. Because <laughs> what I was about to say next was it's not spelled like like pointing. It's spelled P-O-Y-N-T-E-R. So, oh, I, so think no relation. No relation. I think no relation. I think no relation. But uh, that's right. a spooky. That was a spooky connection we just had. A spooky, spooky, well, spooky. Well, if, <laughs> if, uh, if he starts singing, we'll know where it came from. Okay. Good to know. The sale room of an old and famous firm of book auctioneers in London is, of course, a great meeting place for collectors, librarians, dealers, not only when an auction is in progress, but perhaps even more notably when books that are coming on for sale are upon view. It was in such a sale room that the remarkable series of events began, which were detailed to me not many months ago by the person whom they principally affected, namely, Mr. James Denton, M.A., F.S.A., et cetera, et cetera. Okay, what? He has a master's and a, and a, what's an F.S.A.? An F.S.A.? I yeah. don't know. Uh, it sounds like he has lots of credentials, though. He's, he's very fancy. He's a very fancy man. Financial student aid. Okay. Flexible spending account. Full speed ahead. I, I don't know. Ahead. It's some like sort that. of. He's Mr. James um, Denton, master's. Full speed ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Master of the Arts, full speed ahead. Full speed ahead. <laughs> okay. M.A., F.S.A., et cetera, et cetera. Sometime of Trinity Hall, now or lately of Rendcombe Manor in the county of War Warwick. 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 Like Warwick yep. Davis. Yes. Yes. Well, love him. Yeah. Those, the English, one of the things they like to do is add lots of silent letters to words. They do. Yeah. Um, and it's because the English, uh, they invented Scrabble and they're trying to cheat. <laughs> We're just going to cram extra letters in. Yeah, like, yeah, get those points. Get those points. <laughs> he, on a certain spring day, not many years since, was in London for a few days upon business, connected principally with the furnishing of the house which he had just finished building at Rendcombe. It may be a disappointment to you to learn that Rendcombe Manor was new. That I cannot help. <laughs> it's like, sorry. Fuck your feelings. <laughs> Fuck your feelings about it. <laughs> sorry, can't help it. It's, the place was new. This Probably not is. super haunted. What, what am I going to do? <laughs> there had no doubt been an old house, but it was not remarkable for beauty or interest. Even, oh, damn, it's ugly and boring. <laughs> <laughs> well, Even, <laughs> you, know, you know how these new architects are. They just build them boring and ugly. That is true. I mean, I'm actually on my street where I used to live when all the new like house, like rich people houses started popping up and people were demolishing like cute old houses with character. We called them McMansions because they all just like it was like a conveyor belt of the same house over and over. Yeah. So I guess I kind of get it. Some things never change. <laughs> rich people, rich people like boring, tactless boring. houses. <laughs> Even had it been, neither beauty nor interest would have enabled it to resist the disastrous fire, which about a couple of years before the date of my story had raised it to the ground. Whoops. <laughs> I am glad to say that all that was most valuable in it had been saved and that it was fully insured so that it was with a comparatively light heart that Mr. Denton was able to face the task of building a new and considerably more convenient dwelling for himself and his aunt who constituted his whole menage. His menage? Yeah, he's got a, a sketchy relationship with his aunt. 
I li- I literally only know that word in relation to menage a trois. So I'm like, I don't, what's the menage part and why is it his aunt? <laughs> I assume, I mean, it's French. I assume it means something about, um, uh, r- relation, his, his, Oh, okay. 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 Got his it. group. So he's got no um, one else in the world, but his aunt, I think. Yes. But I'm, okay. I'm going to look up what the actual definition is because I'm curious now. Yeah, I mean, it says his, his aunt who constituted his whole menage. So, yeah, it's probably yes. his whole family, right? Menage, the members of a household. Okay, there you go. So, menage a trois is huh. euphemistic. Yeah, that's cute. That's like oh. a, house, a house of three. Oh, there are three members of your household, huh? Right. Huh? <laughs> uh, uh, uh. <laughs> I see what they're getting up to over there in Warwick. I wish the listeners could see the eyebrow things that are happening <laughs> right now. It's the one downfall of having an audio medium is all of the glorious eyebrow acting gets completely lost. Yeah. Maybe one of these a, days. You can take a screen cap what, of this or making a stupid one face. Of, and <laughs> what, One of these days when we're recording one of these, I'm going to record the entire video session and, and listener, you'll be able to see the whole thing that happens. The whole audio visual production. That's fun. <laughs> Until then. Until then, um, until then, back to the menage. Being in London with time on his hands and not far. (laughs) (laughs) You like that transition, huh? (laughs) After these messages, we'll be right back to your menage. Your menage. Okay. To your Nicki Minaj. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Being in London with time on his hands and not far from the. (laughs) Now I got the giggles. (laughs) Oh no. Uh, uh. Okay, how far can we riff on that? How about how about a little Nicki Minaj? <laughs> so now it's also an Adam Sandler joke. <laughs> Do you remember that one rehearsal in Pride and Prejudice where I just couldn't I couldn't get together? I had the giggle so bad. <laughs> it was not good. Yes, I, it was when we were rehearsing the fart scene. <laughs> Yeah, the infamous, you know, you know, that Jane Austen fart scene. Just that, the, that the classic, classic Jane Austen one, the one fart that's in the book. scene. You, you yeah. know, everybody knows what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. That, if nothing else, will tell you the level <sighs> of sophistication we're dealing with in that show. Oh, or just with, yeah, with me, when you talk to me in general. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Being in London with time on his hands and not far from the sale room at which I have obscurely hinted, Mr. Denton thought that he would spend an hour there upon the chance of finding, among that portion of the famous Thomas collection of MSS, which he knew to be then on view, something bearing upon the history or topography of his part of Warwickshire. So he's looking for a book about the history of his neighborhood. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Mr. Denton's got thought- boring taste, but whatever. Isn't it upon the chance of finding among that portion of the famous Thomas collection of MSS? So someone's old like papers. He's looking through someone's old manuscripts in the sale room, I guess. Yes. Okay. Okay. He turned in accordingly, purchased a catalog and ascended to the sale room where, as usual, the books were disposed in cases and some laid out upon the long tables. At the shelves or sitting about at the tables were figures, many of whom were familiar to him. He exchanged nods and greetings with several and then settled down to examine his catalog and note likely items. He had made good progress through about 200 of the 500 lots, every now and then rising to take a volume from the shelf and give it a cursory glance when a hand was laid on his shoulder and he looked up. (gasps) His interrupter was one of those intelligent men with a pointed beard and a flannel shirt of whom the last (laughs) quarter... (laughs) Yeah, yeah, one of those guys. <laughs> Sounds like a bartender at a Brooklyn bar. <laughs> pointy beard, Point, flannel shirt. Pointy beard and a flannel shirt. <laughs> that's true, that's true. <laughs> of whom the last quarter of the 19th century was, it seems to me, very prolific. <laughs> He's like, everybody looked like this yep. in Brooklyn. <laughs> it is no part of my plan to repeat the whole conversation which ensued between the two. I must content myself with stating that it largely referred to common acquaintances e.g. to the nephew of Mr. Denton's friend who had recently married and settled in Chelsea, to the sister-in-law of Mr. Denton's friend who had been seriously indisposed, but was now better. Does that mean they were drunk? Um, <laughs> indisposed? Or, or possibly um, pregnant out of wedlock? Or... Oh, 
Oh yeah, because um, now they're better. Okay, so it went away. <laughs> yeah, I got yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> Who had been seriously indisposed, but was now better. And to a piece of china, which Mr. Denton's friend had purchased some months before at a price much below its true value. From which you will rightly infer that the conversation was rather in the nature of a monologue. <laughs> this guy wouldn't <laughs> shut up. <laughs> I've had a few of those. <laughs> he would not shut up. <laughs> In due time, however, the friend bethought himself that Mr. Denton was there for a purpose, and said he, What are you looking out for in particular? I don't think there's much in this lot. Why, I thought there might be some Warwickshire collections, but I don't see anything under Warwick in the catalogue. No, apparently not, said the friend. All the same, I believe I noticed something like a Warwickshire diary. What was the name again? Drayton? Potter? Painter? Either a P or a D, I feel sure. <laughs> He turned over the leaves quickly. Yes, here it is. Pointer. Lot 486. That might interest you. They're in the books, I think, out on the table. Someone has been looking at them. Well, I must be getting on. Goodbye. You'll look us up, won't you? Couldn't you come this afternoon? We've got a little music about four. Well, then, when you're next in town. He went off. <laughs> so Mr. Denton was like, nah, bro. <laughs> no, I'm not coming over. <laughs> you're too boring. No, not happening. <laughs> you're too boring. <laughs> he went off. Mr. Denton looked at his watch and found to his confusion that he could spare no more than a moment before retrieving his luggage and going for the train. The moment was just enough to show him that there were four large-ish volumes of the diary. <laughs> large-ish. <laughs> Very descriptive. <laughs> Large. Well, also a four-volume diary. All right. right. Somebody okay. had, thought they had important things to say. <sighs> he had a lot of feelings, you know. Dear diary. Oh. I have so much to these say were, today. <laughs> these were all early drafts of the lyrics to Jump for Your Love. <laughs> Tell me why I was going to read this word as largish, <laughs> not largish. <laughs> largish? Yeah. Uh, because the English pronounce everything wrong, and that's just where your head was. <laughs> right. <laughs> So Please, the there were largish volumes yeah, of it really diary. Like, like on the page, it looks like that. The moment was just enough to show him that there were four largish volumes of the diary, <laughs> <laughs> that it concerned the years about 1710, and that there seemed to be a good many insertions in it of various kinds. Okay. Okay. <laughs> of various kinds? Like any good diary, it has various insertions. A good many insertions in it of very <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I mean, yeah, they were all noteworthy, I guess. Dear diary, I gotta write about these insertions, you know? Great. <laughs> well, good good for him. I mean, I if they were all if if them, he was having that many. Them. Yeah. Ma well, maybe good people. for them. Yeah. Well, I, I was thinking him as in the diary keeper. Got it. I but thought you meant the insertion hopefully, giver. Hopefully also for for the other party involved. Right. The inserter. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Whether whether that was one or many. <laughs> well done on everyone. Various kinds. There's some variety happening here. Great. Good for you. Good for you all. <laughs> variety is the spice, as they say. <laughs> oh, okay. Hmm. It concerned the, this diary concerned the years about 1710, and there seemed to be a good many insertions in it of various kinds. It seemed quite worthwhile to leave a commission of five and 20 pounds for it, and this he was able to do, for his usual agent entered the room as he was on the point of leaving it. Oh, so he bought it. Okay. That evening, he rejoined his aunt at their temporary abode, which was a small dower house not many hundred yards from the manor. On the following morning, the two resumed a discussion that had now lasted for some weeks as to the equipment of the new house. Mr. Denton so after laid... buying a book all about <laughs> insertions, he went back yeah. to his menage. <laughs> went back to his auntie. Oh, this is a weird story. <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Uh, Mr. Denton laid before his relative a statement of the results of his visit to town. Particulars of carpets, of chairs, of wardrobes, and of bedroom china. Yes, dear, said his aunt, but I don't see <laughs> any chintzes here. Did you go to? And Mr. Denton stamped on the floor. Where else indeed could he have stamped? <laughs> 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 oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh dear oh dear oh dear he said the one thing i missed i am sorry the fact is i was on my way there and i happened to be passing robins's his aunt threw up her hands <laughs> robins's then the next thing will be another parcel of horrible old books at some outrageous price i do think james when i am taking all this trouble for you you might contrive to remember the one or two things which I specially begged you to seek after. It's not as if I was asking it for myself. I don't know whether you think I get any pleasure out of it. Don't say pleasure. No, 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 no. Don't say pleasure, <laughs> Auntie. Mm -mm. Also, is this is this aunt incredibly old or a talking <laughs> <Yeah>. goat? <laughs> no, she's just real old. <laughs> okay. Right. I've decided she's real old and she's British, but the narrator and Denton are not. <laughs> That's what I've decided. Got They're it. both from New just, Jersey. <laughs> I was getting I was getting vibes of uh, Finn Rizel from Willow when she's a goat. Willow, oh. you oh, idiot. Yeah. You're right. Was well, very trembly. You're right. She's sort of okay. I I risen. I revised my statement. She's an old goat lady. Okay. <laughs> 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 who takes pleasure in her nephew who takes pleasure oh god oh god <laughs> okay so she says <laughs> i don't know whether you think i get any pleasure out of it but if so i can assure you it's very much the reverse the thought and worry and trouble i have over it you have no idea of and you have simply to go to the shops and order the things Mr. Denton interposed a moan of penitence. <laughs> Stop. I hate the I hate the word moan. I hate it. I hate it. Really, moan is what gets you. Yes, I hate it. And then he says, "Oh, aunt." <laughs> oh God. Oh, and then, auntie. No, 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 no. Bad, 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 Kenneth. Bad, Kenneth. <laughs> <laughs> so she says and so she says <laughs> yes that's all very well dear and i don't want to speak sharply but you must know how very annoying it is okay auntie <laughs> how very annoying it is particularly as it delays the whole of our business for i can't tell how long here is wednesday the simpsons come tomorrow and you can't leave them then on saturday we have friends as you know coming for tennis Yes, indeed. You spoke of asking them yourself, but of course I had to write the notes, and it is ridiculous, James, to look like that. We must occasionally be civil to our neighbors. You wouldn't like to have it said we were perfect bears. <laughs> bears? <laughs> bears? <laughs> no, it's okay. Just be a goat. That's, well, no, I mean, I guess she's right. Like, when my neighbors are being weird, I'm always like, oh, they're such fucking bears. You know, I guess that's a normal thing to say. <laughs> okay. It, is it? No. <laughs> no, it's not at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and then she forgets what she's saying. She goes, what was I saying? Well, anyhow, <laughs> it comes to this, that it must be Thursday in next week, at least, before you can go to town again. And until we have decided upon the chintzes, it is impossible to settle upon one single other thing. Mr. Denton ventured to suggest that as the paint and wallpapers had been dealt with, this was too severe a view. But his aunt was not prepared to admit that at the moment. Nor indeed was there any proposition he could have advanced which she would have found herself able to accept. However, as the day went on, she receded a little from this position, <laughs> examined, with, <laughs> examined with lessening disfavor the samples and price lists submitted by her nephew, and even in some cases gave a qualified approval to his choice. Okay. Oh, I don't like it. <laughs> They're talking about decorating. I know, I know, decorating. It's all decorating. <laughs> <laughs> As for him, he was naturally somewhat dashed by the consciousness of duty unfulfilled, but more so by the prospect of a lawn tennis party, which, though an inevitable evil in August, he had thought there was no occasion to fear in May. <laughs> but he was, to some extent, cheered by the arrival on the Friday morning of an intimation that he had secured the price of 12 pound tens. Hmm. Or... Uh, 1,210 pounds? 
I don't know. Pound uh, sign? 12 pounds, 12 pounds, 10 shillings. <gasps> 10 shillings. Thank you. I was like, what's yep. this little S? 12 pounds, 10 shillings. Thank you. The four volumes of Pointer's Manuscript Diary, and still more by the arrival on the next morning of the diary itself. Yay, he got the diary. Sweet. The necessity of taking Mr. and Mrs. Simpson for a drive in the car on Saturday morning, and of attending to his neighbors and guests that afternoon, prevented him from doing more than open the parcel until the party had retired to bed on the Saturday night. It was then that he made certain of the fact, which he had before only suspected, that he had indeed acquired the diary of Mr. William Pointer, squire of Accrington, about four miles from his own parish, that same Pointer who was for a time a member of the Circle of Oxford Antiquaries, the center of which was Thomas Hearn, and with whom Hearn seems ultimately to have quarreled, a not uncommon episode in the career of that excellent man. (laughs) <laughs> so he's argumentative <laughs> dude picked a lot of fights <laughs> as is the case with Her- here i don't know i'm thinking with it as is the case with here own collections the diary of pointer contained a good many notes from printed books descriptions of coins and other antiquities that had been brought to his notice and drafts of letters on these subjects besides the chronicle of everyday events that's why it's such a long diary it's got all sorts of shit in it i'm just writing every damn thing Everything. Come on, dude. You need an editor. Oh, yeah. No, he's like, I'm getting paid by the word. (laughs) One day, (laughs) someone's going (laughs) to. The description in the sale catalog had given Mr. Denton no idea of the amount of interest which seemed to lie in the book. And he sat up reading in the first of the four volumes until a reprehensibly late hour. I get it, buddy. That's me on TikTok. You think um, reading other people's diaries was late 19th and early 20th century TikTok? 100%. Because TikTok is just people's weird, insane one minute video diaries. I mean, half of it is just people taping themselves like, so like, why are these plastic cookie tins so hard to open? Like just, like, just random, random thoughts <laughs> that they send out into the interweb. Do you know what I learned today? What? Coconuts are not native to the Caribbean. They migrated there, but they didn't migrate with travelers or conquistadors. They literally floated across the ocean. (laughs) Coconuts migrated. That's so cute. (laughs) They just bobbed on over. They're just like, here we go. (laughs) That's really funny. How how and why? what, What led you to this information today? You're always d- finding out the most random things. <laughs> I don't remember. There's a decent chance that it was a video know. I watched or a meme I saw. There's also a decent yep. chance that while I was looking up <laughs> the tradition of horror stories around Christmas, I followed a couple of little blue links on Wikipedia and suddenly oh, found yeah. myself reading up on the great coconut migration yep. of, <laughs> of AD 126. Right. The prehistoric coconut travel. <laughs> No, that's my favorite game to play is how long can I be on Wikipedia for? How many things can I, you know, find out about? It's so fun. Sort of like playing the the six degrees of Kevin Bacon, except what Mm -hmm. you do is you start with Kevin Bacon and you see how far and obscure from Kevin Bacon you can get in six link clicks. Right. Kevin Bacon, World War One planes. (laughs) You know, you're like, how? (laughs) Oh, God. On the Sunday morning after church, his aunt came into the study and was diverted from what she had been going to say to him by the sight of the four brown leather quartos on the table. What are these? She said suspiciously. New, aren't they? Oh, are these the things that made you forget my chintzes? I thought so. Disgusting. What did you give for them, I should like to know? Over ten pounds? James, it is really sinful. I love this woman. (laughs) I know, I'm actually growing very fond of her. She's pretty funny. (laughs) Well, if you have money to throw away on this kind of thing, there can be no reason why you should not subscribe, and subscribe handsomely, to my anti-vivisection league. What? (laughs) What? Vivisection. We gotta know what it is. Look it up. (laughs) The anti-vivisection movement was a movement opposed to operations on live animals for scientific research. Okay. So the the anti the anti vivisection league was like an early version of PETA. 
A pita, yeah, okay. okay. Well, you know what? I, I like Auntie a little bit more now. Yeah, that's great. O- opposed <laughs> opposed to um to animal cruelty for the sake of scientific testing. I love it. She said That's you, awesome. She said, You're gonna throw away money on this diary, you can give some money to help these poor little animals. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. That's great. Uh, <clears throat> that's great. All right, all right, Auntie. I am done making fun of you. No, Good I love for you, it. you I mean, weird old goat lady. Weird old goat lady. <laughs> that's why she's anti vivisectionist. Because she's, she's a goat. Yeah. She doesn't want to get chopped up for science. She's like, don't tread on me. <laughs> that's something different, but you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god what a great connection uh, so oh, she said dumb. there could be <laughs> she said if you have money to throw away on this thing there's no reason why you should not subscribe to my league there is not indeed james and i shall be very seriously annoyed if who did you say wrote them old mr pointer of accrington well of course there is some interest in getting together old papers about this neighborhood but ten pounds she picked up one of the volumes, not that which her nephew had been reading, and opened it at random, dashing it to the floor the next instant with a cry of disgust as an earwig fell from between the pages. <laughs> Miss, I thought she loved animals. <laughs> Apparently not creepy insects. Not an earwig, yeah. Mr. Denton picked it up with a smothered expletive <laughs> and said, Poor book, I think you're rather hard on Mr. Pointer. Was I, my dear? I beg his pardon, but you know I cannot abide these horrid creatures. (laughs) (laughs) I'm so glad you're tickled by this. (laughs) (laughs) Let me see if I've done any mischief. No, I think all's well, but look here what you've opened him on. Dear me, yes, to be sure, how very interesting. Do unpin it, James, and let me look at it. It was a piece of patterned stuff about the size of the quarto page, to which it was fastened by an old-fashioned pin. James detached it and handed it to his aunt, carefully replacing the pin in the paper. Now, I do not know exactly what the fabric was, but it had a design printed upon it, which completely fascinated Miss Denton. She went into raptures over it, held it against the wall, made James do the same. (laughs) I'm rapture. (laughs) <laughs> that she might retire to oh, contemplate. Oh, this fabric. Oh, the fabric. <laughs> and she went into raptures over it, held it against the wall, made James do the same, that she might retire to contemplate it from a distance, then poured <laughs> over it at close quarters and ended her examination by expressing in the warmest terms her appreciation of the taste of the ancient Mr. Pointer who had had the happy idea of preserving this sample in his diary. (laughs) Wow. Mr. Pointer. Wow. Yeah, seriously. She's like, wow. It is a most charming pattern, she said, and remarkable too. (laughs) I added the O, full disclaimer, listener, I added the O. Look, James, how delightfully the lines ripple. It reminds one of hair very much, doesn't it? And then these knots of ribbon at intervals, they give just the relief of color that is wanted. I wonder... I was going to say, said James with deference, I wonder if it would cost much to have it copied for our curtains. Copied? How could you have it copied, James? Well, I don't know the details, but I suppose that is a printed pattern and that you could have a block cut from it in wood or metal. Now, really, that is a capital idea, James. I am almost inclined to be glad that you were so... that you forgot the chintzes on Monday. Oh, now she's happy he forgot the chintzes. (laughs) Now she's happy because she's got a new little boy toy from the past. I am and this hot fabric. so confused by what the hell is going on. Oh, just couldn't even tell you. Couldn't tell you. But let's see the story. Oh, is this a ghost story, by the way? Where are the ghosts? I, I think so. <laughs> okay, let's Most see. of his stories are. <laughs> but then again, I thought I was giving you a horror story with that Poe. That's true. That, and that Poe was like, the devil danced a jig. That was the, the whole story. <laughs> oh my god okay so if this says, is just a if if this is just a funny little story about a little old lady who gets excited about fabric samples that's you know cool. what 
that the wholesome content to go with our talk about wholesome Thanksgiving. You know, it's great. It's all yeah. great. <laughs> So she says, at any rate, I promise to forgive and forget if you get this lovely old thing copied. No one will have anything in the least like it. And mind, James, we won't allow it to be sold. Now I must go. And I've totally forgotten what it was I came in to say. Never mind. It'll keep. (laughs) 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 Old dips. Great. I'm writing this into a short play. Seriously, I love her. She's really great. I'm uh, just full disclosure. I'm gonna be mad if you don't cast me as her in the short play. Right, that's, just that's so fair. you know, or like that's at least fair. an audition. Give me an audition. Yep. Okay, great. Actually, this tape is my audition right here. This is it. Yeah. <laughs> After his aunt had gone, James Denton devoted a few minutes to examining the pattern more closely than he had yet had a chance of doing. He was puzzled to think why it should have struck Miss Benton so forcibly. <laughs> It seemed to him not specially remarkable or pretty. No doubt it was suitable enough for a curtain pattern. It ran in vertical bands, and there was some indication that these were intended to converge at the top. She was right, too, in thinking that these main bands resembled rippling, almost curling tresses of hair. Well, the main thing was to find out by means of trade directories or otherwise what firm would undertake the reproduction of an old pattern of this kind. Not to delay the reader over this portion of the story, a list of likely names was made out and Mr. Denton fixed a day for calling on them, or some of them, with his sample. (laughs) So he's like, I'm not going to bore you this time, but I'll bore you with a bunch of other stuff later about the fabric. (laughs) The first two visits which he paid were unsuccessful, but there is luck in odd numbers. (laughs) The firm in Bermondsey, which was third on his list, was accustomed to handling this line. The evidence they were able to produce justified their being entrusted with the job. Our Mr. Cattell took a fervent personal interest in it. It's ear trending, isn't it, sir? He said, never mind, not ear trending. Never mind. Wait, let me go back because he means to say heart rending, but he's British. So it's all rending. It's all rending. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it does say ear trending though just in my defense okay I, I like ear trending <laughs> doing it again our mr cattell took a fervent personal interest in it oh it's all rending in it sir he said to picture the quality of really lovely medieval stuff of this coin that lays well nigh unnoticed in many of our residential country houses much of the imperil, I take it, of being cast aside as so much rubbish. What is it Shakespeare says? Unconsidered trifles. Ah, I often say he has a word for us all, sir. I say Shakespeare, but I'm well aware all don't owe with me there. I had something of an upset the other day when a gentleman came in, a titled man, too he was, and I think he told me he wrote on the topic. And I happened to cite out something about Hercules and the painted cloth. Dear me, you never see such a pother. <laughs> what? <laughs> Dear me, you never see such a pother. But as to this, what you've kindly confided to us is a piece of work we shall take a real enthusiasm in achieving it out to the very best of our ability. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Okay. I like this guy too. I like him too. This is is great. This is just a happy Ah. little story full of ridiculous characters. It's so happy. Okay. I love Cockney. What man (laughs) has done, as I was observing only a few weeks back to another esteemed client, man can do. And in three to four weeks' time, all being well, we shall hope to lay before you evidence to that effect, sir. Take the address of Mr. Higgins, if you please. I don't know who Mr. Higgins is, but okay. <laughs> oh, presumably our main character. Well, no, our main character No, he's Denton. Yeah. Denton. Maybe he's got an assistant. Mr. Cattell has an assistant or something. Let's that see. That makes sense. <clears throat> oh, God. Cattell with Higgins. Okay. <laughs> Such was the general drift of Mr. Cattell's observations on the occasion of his first interview with Mr. Denton. About a month later, being advised that some samples were ready for his inspection. This is literally a story about fabric. This is a story about fabric. So far, yeah. (laughs) 
I love it. So, Mr. Denton. So well, being in- well, so there is, if this is a Scooby-Doo mystery, the right. ghost is just going to be like Miss Denton wearing the fabric with holes cut out. Oh, that's true. Maybe she's like trying to get like her ghost costume. Like she's like, this will be a, yeah, this will be a great fabric for my ghost costume. That's what this whole thing is about. Oh, you called it. If that actually happens in the end, I will give you $50. Sweet. You're like, okay. I like it when um, I can earn money and I didn't even have to bet. That's great. <laughs> That's how much hubris I have. Okay. About a month later, being advised that some samples were ready for his inspection, Mr. Denton met him again and had, it seems, reason to be satisfied with the faithfulness of the reproduction of the design. It had been finished off at the top in accordance with the indication I mentioned, so that the vertical bands joined. Uh, Did we remember that riveting detail, readers? The vertical bands joined up at the top. (laughs) This sample, okay? Very important. Oh, God. I wonder what was going through his mind. Well, we don't know where it's going yet. Maybe it's all important. Maybe it's all important. Let's see. So, something still needed to be done in the way of matching the color of the original. Mr. Cattell had suggestions of a technical kind to offer, with which I need not trouble you. Oh, thank you. Again, he's sparing us <laughs> the boring details. He had also views as to the general desirability of the pattern, which were vaguely adverse. <laughs> what? You say you don't wish this to be supplied except into personal friends equipped with an authorization from yourself, sir. It shall be done. I quite understand your wish to keep it exclusive. Lend it a catch it, dead, doesn't it? To the sweet. Whoa. What? Lends it a catch it, does it not? To the sweet? What's every man's, it's been said, is no man's. <laughs> uh, I'm guessing catch it is, it's written in dialect, but it's probably supposed to be cachet. Oh, well, lends it a cachet, does it not? To the sweet. But because he's got an accent, he probably pronounces it cash it because he's only ever seen it written and it looks like cash it. You're right. Oh, thank you. That's very helpful. Got it. So he said, I quite understand your wish to keep it exclusive. Lends it a cash it. Does it not to the sweet? (laughs) (laughs) What's every man's it's it's been said? What's every man's it's been said is no man's. There we go. (laughs) I'm so sorry, (laughs) listeners. I'm doing my best here. Okay. (laughs) Do you think it would be popular if it were generally obtainable? Asked Mr. Denton. I I oddly think it, sir, said Cattell, (laughs) pensively clasping his beard. I oddly think it. Not popular. It wasn't popular with the man that cut the block, was it, Mr. Higgins? Did he find it a difficult job? He... No call to do so, sir, but the fact is that the artistic temperament, and all men are artists, sir, every man of them, true artists as much as many that the world styles by that term, it's apt to take some strange, oddly accountable likes or dislikes, and here was an example. The twice or thrice that I went to inspect his progress, language I could not understand, for that's habitual to him, but real distaste for what I should call a dainty enough thing, I did not, nor am I now able to fathom. It seemed, said Mr. Cattell, looking narrowly upon Mr. Denton, as if the man scented something almost evil in the design. <gasps> okay, There okay, we go. Okay. Now it's coming. Indeed. Did he tell you so? I can't say I see anything sinister in it myself. Neither can I, sir. In fact, I said as much. Come, Gatwick, I've said. What's to do here? What's the reason of your prejudice? For I can call it no more than that. But no. No explanation was forthcoming, and I was merely reduced, as I am now, to a shrug of the shoulders and a qui bono. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know what that is at all. (laughs) Uh, It's probably his weird pronunciation of... Quibono, quibono. Uh, of something in Italian or Italian, or, yeah, 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 yeah. However, here it is, and with that, the technical side of the question came to the front again. <laughs> I 
<laughs> the matching of the colors for the background, the hem, and the knots of ribbon was by far the longest part of the business and necessitated many sendings to and fro of the original pattern and of new samples. During August, during part of August and September, too, the Dentons were away from the manor, so that it was not until October was well in that a sufficient quantity of the stuff had been manufactured to finish curtains for the three or four bedrooms which were to be fitted up with it. These fuckers mm. have taken four months to get these curtains made. Well, they had to oh. not only reproduce a pattern that was on another thing. Yeah. Um, by hand, they couldn't just scan it into a computer, yep. but they also extrapolated the rest of the pattern and sort of invented it to fit the style. So, and all because Auntie Goat has a hard on for this old guy in the diary, and she had to have these curtains. <laughs> yep. Oh God. Okay. On the feast of Simon and Jude, the aunt and nephew returned from a short visit to find all completed, and their satisfaction at the general effect was great. Yay! The new curtains, in particular, agreed to admiration with their surroundings. When Mr. Denton was dressing for dinner and took stock of his room, in which there was a large amount of the chintz displayed, he congratulated himself over and over again on the luck which had first made him forget his aunt's commission and had then put into his hands this extremely effective means of remedying his mistake. <laughs> the pattern was, as he said at dinner, so restful and yet so far from being dull, and Miss Denton, who, by the way, had none of the stuff in her own room, was much disposed <laughs> to agree with him. <laughs> All that, and it's not even in her room. Oh, my oh, God. Oh, I love it. Oh, no, I don't want it in my room. Not in my quarters. Not in my quarters, dear. Only oh, in no. yours. I won't be able to focus if it's in my room. I, bad, bad, bad. <laughs> I shan't sleep a wink. <laughs> Focus on what? Focus on what? <laughs> no. At breakfast next morning, he was induced to qualify his satisfaction to some extent, but very slightly. There is one thing I rather regret, he said, that we allowed them to join up the vertical bands of the pattern at the top. Well, I think it would have been better to leave that alone. What is going on with these bands at the top? I am so confused. Okay. Okay. It, it's um, there's gonna be a payoff. There's gonna be a payoff. Some people some people take their fabric work very seriously. Seriously. So he says, I think it would have been better to leave that alone. Oh, said his aunt interrogatively. Yes, as I was reading in bed last night, they kept catching my eye rather. That is, I found myself looking across at them every now and then. There was an effect as if someone kept peeping out between the curtains in one place or another where there was no edge, and I think that was due to the joining up of the bands at the top. The only other thing that troubled me was the wind. <gasps> the curtains were moving. Oh, 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 and then she says, Why, I thought it was a perfectly still night. Oh. <gasps> Perhaps it was only on my side of the house, but there was enough to sway my curtains and rustle them more than I wanted. They're haunted! Mm -hmm. They're haunted! They're haunted curtains! Oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> that night, a bachelor friend of James Denton's came... Okay, <laughs> let me read. Let me not read so fast. I'm excited <laughs> now. Down. I'm excited now. Okay, but let me go be a good reader for the listener. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, cool. So this is this is where I try to fade in some like dissonant um, <laughs> dissonant strings underneath. I to, love to add it. some to add some yeah. tension to the next paragraph. I love it. Okay, great. Mm -mm. That night, a bachelor friend of James Denton's came to stay and was lodged in a room on the same floor as his host, but at the end of a long passage, halfway down which was a red baize door, put there to cut off the draft and intercept noise. The party of three had separated, Miss Denton a good first, the two men at about eleven. James Denton, not yet inclined for bed, sat him down in an armchair and read for a time. Then he dozed and then he woke and bethought himself that his brown spaniel, who ordinarily slept in his room, had not come upstairs with him. Then he thought he dog, was... I'm going to be pissed. Seriously, I'm like, wait, do I need to go to doesthedogdie.com and look up this story? <laughs> As I look up... Many movies that I watch because I won't watch them if the dog dies. <laughs> I didn't know that was a website, but that's brilliant. Oh, yeah. Does the do does the dog die com. Use it. <laughs> I'm going to remember that. <laughs> then he thought he, he was mistaken. 
for happening to move his hand, which hung down over the arm of the chair within a few inches of the floor, he felt on the back of it just the slightest touch of a surface of hair. And stretching it out in that direction, he stroked and patted a rounded something. But the feel of it, and still more the fact that instead of a responsive movement, absolute stillness greeted his touch, made him look over the arm. No, no, I don't like it. I don't like it. What he had been touching rose to meet him. It was in the attitude of one that had crept along the floor on its belly, and it was, so far as could be collected, a human figure. But of the face, which was now rising to within a few inches of his own, no feature was discernible, only hair. <laughs> Shapeless as it was, there was about it so horrible an air of menace that as he bounded from his chair and rushed from the room, he heard himself moaning with fear, and doubtless he did right to fly. As he dashed into the bay's door that cut the passage in two, and forgetting that it opened towards him, beat against it with all the force in him. <laughs> oh, no. It swings the other way. It's a pull. It's not a push. Dude, it opens in. It opens in. It opens it's in. It's a pull. It's a pull. He beat against it with all the force in him. He felt a soft, ineffectual tearing at his back, which all the same seemed to be growing in power as if the hand, or whatever worse than a hand, was there, were becoming more material as the pursuer's rage was more concentrated. Huh. Then he re Oh, God. Then he remembered the trick of the door. He got it open, he shut it behind him, he gained his friend's room, and that is all we need to know. It seems curious that during all the time that had elapsed since the purchase of Pointer's diary, James Denton should not have sought an explanation of the presence of the pattern that had been pinned into it. Well, he had read the diary through without finding it mentioned and had concluded that there was nothing to be said. But on leaving Randcombe Manor, he did not know whether for good, as he naturally insisted upon doing on the day after experiencing the horror I have tried to put into words. Well, yeah. <laughs> precisely he took the diary with him and at his seaside lodgings he examined more narrowly the portion whence the pattern had been taken what he remembered having suspected about it turned out to be correct two or three leaves were pasted together but written upon as was patent when they were held up to the light they yielded easily to steaming for the paste had lost much of its strength and they contained something relevant to the pattern <gasps> Somebody stuck them go. pages together. The entry was made in 1707. <clears throat> Old Mr. Casbury of Accrington told me this day much of young Sir Everard Charlotte, whom he remembered commoner of University College and thought was of the same family as Dr. Arthur Charlotte, now master of ye Cole. Okay. Cole? I don't know. This Charlotte was a personable young gent, but a loose atheistical companion and a great lifter, as then they call the hard drinkers. <laughs> and for <laughs> lifters, great and lifter. for mm -hmm. <laughs> right lifter of the bottle, <laughs> and for what I know, do so now. He was noted and subject to several censures at different times for his extravagancies. And if the full history of his debaucheries had been known, no doubt would have been expelled. Ye call supposing that no interest had been employed on his behalf, of which Mr. Casbury had some suspicion. He was a very beautiful person, and constantly wore his own hair, which was very abundant, from which, and his loose way of living, the cant name for him was Absalom, and he was accustomed to say that indeed he believed he had shortened old David's days, meaning his father, Sir Job Charlotte, an old worthy cavalier. Absalom, that's a Bible name, right? Absalom? Uh, I think so. Son of David? Yeah, okay. Got it. Hang on, I'm, I'm going to look it up. Absalom, according to Hebrew Bible, was the third son of David, king of Israel. Uh, describes him as the most handsome man in the kingdom. There you go. He eventually rebelled against his father uh, and was killed during the battle. Wow. <laughs> so this kid was a regular Absalom. So he was real pretty. Real pretty. <laughs> Note that Mr. Casbury said that he remembers not the year of Sir Everard Charlotte's death, 
but it was 1692 or three. He died suddenly in October. Several lines describing his unpleasant habits and reputed delinquencies are omitted. <laughs> <laughs> M.R. Having... James, I do appreciate that you're going through and just cutting out all of the unnecessary yeah. stuff from the story. Thank you. Yeah. He's Brevity trimming is the... the soul. Totally. He's, he's trimming all the fat, but keeping everything about the fabric. You gotta, yep. you gotta know about that fabric. <laughs> Having seen him in such topping spirits the night before, Mr. Casbury was amazed when he learned of the death. He was found in the town ditch. The hair was, as said, plucked clean off his head. Most bells in Oxford rung out for him, being a nobleman, and he was buried next night in St. Peter's in the East. But two years after, being to be moved to his country estate by his successor, it was said the coffin, breaking by mischance, proved quite full of hair, which sounds fabulous, <laughs> but yet I believe precedents are upon record, as in Dr. Plot's history of Staffordshire. And I know they mean fabulous, like made up, fantastical, but it's funny yeah. that they're like, his coffin was full of his hair, which sounds fabulous. fabulous. Oh, fabulous. His hair. Oh, uh, <laughs> come on, uh, honey. <laughs> a, a, a truly done up cousin it. Yeah, right, right. right. <laughs> but like went into the coffin bald, but then there was hair in the coffin. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. His chambers being afterwards stripped, Mr. Casbury came by part of the hangings of it, which twas said this Charlotte had designed expressly for a memorial of his hair, giving the fellow that drew it a lock to work by, and the piece which I have fastened in here was parcel of the same, which Mr. Casbury gave to me. He said he believed there was a subtlety in the drawing, but had never discovered it himself, nor much liked to pour upon it. Okay, I see. So they used haunted hair to make the original design. Yep. The money spent upon the curtains might as well have been thrown into the fire as they were. Mr. Cattell's comment upon what he heard of the story took the form of a quotation from Shakespeare. You may guess it without difficulty. It began with the words, There are more things. The end. Ah! Yeah. <laughs> now that is a good Yay. way to kick off the holiday season right there. Yay. <laughs> Wait, do you know what this Shakespeare quotation is, though? I'm ashamed to say I don't know what it is. What there, line does it start there with? Are, there, are more? There, are, there are more things in heaven and earth that are dreamt of in your philosophy, Horatio. <gasps> it's from Hamlet. Yes, Hamlet. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Spooky. Yeah. So it was absolutely the like spirit of the bald corpse that he yes. thought was the dog. Yeah. Right. Because it said he was like a faceless, or was he all hair? Or was he, he would like cousin was, it? I forget if he was bald or if he yeah, was cousin it. He was so he was he was all hair, and but no face. Like, but no face. So he was. Right. He, he was thought he was it. the spaniel. He thought he yeah, was the spaniel. He thought he was the dog. Yeah. Um. And so clearly, like, the Ugh. hair, which is the thing that he was so proud of and made him yep. so Fabio, oh, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, th is the thing that when he died, the, whoever, like, his head was shaved as, like, a final act of, um, right. screw oh, this you. guy. Yeah. And it's <gasps> why, clearly, like, it sounds like this was a, a situation of murder, and he oh, yeah. came back in the form of a hair monster <laughs> to get back at the people who murdered him. Yeah. I love it. I love it. That's how I want to come back. It's just like a full weave, just like a wig floating around terrorizing people. <laughs> it sounds great. <laughs> Ooh, that's a good question. What? Dear Camper, if you died under um, mysterious and violent circumstances and got to choose how you came back to exact your revenge, what form would you choose? Ooh, fun. That is fun. I'm curious. I think haunted wig would be really fun. You know what would also be really fun, though, is if you were like, okay, not something like terrible or like, you know, horribly painful or anything, but like a, a real, like just a little annoyance that someone can't remedy. So like I would want to be like, 
you know, when you have a long sleeve shirt and you push the sleeves up to wash your hands, but then if you go like this, the water runs down and it gets just a little bit of your long sleeve wet on your elbow. You you would want to be the wet spot? Yes. That wet spot <laughs> is so annoying to me. I would want to be that on both arms of my enemies for eternity. They could never have a dry elbow. I was I was thinking sort of along the same lines, um, not not a wet spot, but I was thinking I would want to come back as like the thing that gets in your shoe that is a little bigger than a grain of sand, Mm -hmm. but so small that you can't find it. And it just Mm -hmm. sits there forever and it rubs whenever you step. That's fabulous. I love it. We're so petty. That is my, (laughs) that is my reincarnation (laughs) revenge. (laughs) It's not quite as fantastical as, as a a hair monster, but also, you know, whatever. (laughs) Equally as effective, equally as effective, probably over time. Like, I think yeah. I would probably go crazy if every time yeah. I put a shoe on my right foot, there was a pebble in it. Yeah. Imagine it's like it's cold enough to wear a long sleeve shirt and you never have a dry shirt. Your shirt is always partially wet. Hell. Hell on earth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And even in, even in your closet, you pull it out of the closet. And it's wet. Yeah, no. It's, it's wet. always. Yep. Wash it. Take it out of the dryer. There are two wet spots mm-hmm. on each elbow. Yep. Correct. <laughs> How diabolical. How diabolical. Oh. Oh. <laughs> the perpetually well, this, wet spot. This story brought us some beautiful characters. It brought us goat, sexual goat auntie. It brought us um, chimney sweep, uh, like book appraiser. I don't even remember what that guy's job was, but chimney um, chimney sweep fabric re, uh, reupholsterer. Yeah. And, uh, it brought and us the dog did trending. not die. Uh huh. Ear trending, and the dog didn't die, and I'm really and happy about that. And the dog didn't that. die, which is good. I'm yeah. really happy about that. <laughs> um, dear camper, uh, if you are a regular listener, <laughs> you know that at the end of every episode, we have a little passcode that you can send as either the subject or in the the body of a message to us, either emailing us at fifty fifty artsproduction at gmail dot com or reaching out on any of the social media. Just look for Campfire Classics. <laughs> and this week. The secret passcode is sexual goat auntie. (laughs) I'm so honored. I'm so glad. (laughs) Oh, God. Ah, fabulous. Um, That's good stuff. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's it. Do you have anything that you would like to say before we wrap up? Oh, no, just thank you. This was really fun. And that was a good story you picked. That's a good story. That was a fun yeah, one. Well MR James, he's never let us down. That was great. Yeah. That was a good one. All right. Well, uh, that's it from us. So do track us down on all the social medias. Please um, subscribe and like and do all of those lovely things. Uh, tell five friends about Campfire Classics and make them listen. And if they don't want to, do it anyway. Um, and that is pretty much it. So until next week, this has been Campfire Classics, where we try to read those books that look really good on your shelf. 